1 John, if you turn there with me. 1 John. Uh, this is, uh, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, uh, we haven't done 1 John since 1999. Uh, that's a long time ago. That's a long time ago. I, I dare say most of the children that I'm looking at right now weren't even in existence then. Uh, I'm sure you weren't, as a matter of fact. But um, it is a blessing to go through 1 John. There's a lot of misunderstanding about the book of 1 John. And so some of what I'll cover tonight is a teeny bit of repeat over the last couple of weeks because it also beautifully goes together. But uh, this week... Um, actually, um, the, uh, it was sent on November 9th, which was Friday. I received this email. <clears throat> By the way, this is not rare that we get emails like this, but this one just kind of gripped me. I won't say who it's from. I won't say his name uh, for obvious reasons. You don't want to share things like that. But he wrote and he said this. At 14 years old, I was saved after hearing a Jesus plus nothing message. That was 19 years ago. A year ago, I got caught up into bad teaching when the way of the master, which is Ray Comfort's ministry, those of you know who he is, when the way of the master was introduced into the church I was attending. Ray Comfort's teaching sowed seeds of, seeds of confusion, and I began to doubt my salvation. I began to look at my life for proof of salvation, and no matter how hard I tried, I still doubted. It spiraled out of control, and eventually I believed I was lost forever, or that I was never elected to be saved. I was suicidal for a few months. I was such a wreck that my wife filed for separation. I was always sad and hopeless. God pointed me to you and other free grace preachers. You helped me overcome problem passages in the Bible and showed me how to rightly divide the word of truth. I'm so secure in my salvation. Thank you so much. I love you, brother. Uh, I wrote back to him and I said, hey, blank, uh, thank you for the encouraging words. We are so grateful that you've been helped through our ministry. Please let others know we are there and get them to watch and listen. We are in this together for the sake of the gospel. And then I said, have you gotten back with your wife? God bless you, Pastor Kakuza. And he just wrote back today, and he says, after several months of separation, my wife and I are back together. Praise God. Last year was without a doubt the toughest year of my life and very strange. Oddly enough, I wouldn't change it if I could. Sounds like a song. <laughs> I'm more zealous for God and passionate for his gospel than I've ever been. I recommend your sermons to anyone that will listen, particularly your sermons expounding on James and Galatians. I recommend your ser sermons on Calvinism and eternal security to people as well. Get this next line. Have you ever preached on 1 John? I love your work. Thanks for your time, Dr. Kukuza. And I said uh, just a while ago uh, this afternoon, I said, hey, blank, this, that is good news about your wife. Guess what? We are doing First John right now. They are available through our live streaming tab on our website menu bar if you can't wait until a few weeks from now when they will start going on YouTube and Sermon Audio, Dr. Kukuza. So... I just want to say thank you again to uh, Andy and Beth and also for Jeff for your uh, giving of yourselves, making our media ministry what it is. Um, uh, these people, uh, we, you know, no one would know if it wasn't for faithful people in our church stepping up to the plate, doing ministry, being so faithful, getting it out there. And um, this, is, this is not uncommon, these kind of emails, Okay. And folks, what does this show you? It shows you the depth of the confusion that is out there today on, uh, on what the Bible says and theology and so forth. Now, 1 John is one of those books that is a very confusing book for most people. And the reason is, is they start off wrong. 
they start off wrong. Most people, what they do is they approach 1 John, and they approach it in a wrong way to begin with. They think, as, by the way, a lot of your study Bibles are going to tell them, or a lot of preachers are going to tell them, or, you know, this and that, books, commentaries, etc. These commentaries, which it's just amazing to me, you know, it's like the elephant in the room again. This lordship salvation, Calvinistic, works for salvation, perseverance of the saints, false theology. It's there. Everybody knows it's there. Everybody is, has anxiety about it except the extremely self-righteous. But they don't know what to do. And they'll come to 1 John and they'll, and they'll, they'll know in their heart. They read 1 John. And, and to be honest with you, I bet a lot of them don't like reading 1 John because the way they're approaching it, most people approach 1 John like they do James chapter 2 from a perspective that it's teaching works for salvation. Well, friend, listen, get back to the context, all right? 1 John is not talking about, uh, it is not a book about proving whether you're saved or not. As I mentioned last week, who are you trying to prove it to to begin with? Are you trying to prove it to God? Doesn't he already know whether you're saved or not? Are you trying to prove it to somebody else? Well, why waste your time? They'll never be happy. Are you trying to prove it to yourself? Well, that's a, that's a place of despair. That's not what 1 John is about. 1 John is not a book about proving whether you're saved or not. It is a book about uh, seeing whether we are walking in fellowship with God or not. Now, if you get that, you'll get 1 John. If you look at it through that grid, which is the only grid, the only way of viewing it, with, with fits, uh, which fits the rest of the Bible, if you see it as, okay, these are tests not whether I'm saved. These are tests whether I'm walking in fellowship or not. Oh, there's a big difference there. And there's lots of, of uh, hints and statements in 1 John that prove very clearly that it's not written to prove whether we're saved or to test whether we're saved. That's a lot of the way people look at it. Well, if, if John was, was writing to test whether these people were saved or not, he would not be calling them brethren. He would not be calling them one of the things that you're going to find here in chapter 2. He would not be referring to them over and over again as little children. Okay? Because little children means that you've got a parent. And in the context, the parent would be the father. And if the father is your parent, you're not lost, you're saved. Okay? Now, if he was questioning whether they're saved or not, he would say something more like, you people. Well, maybe not that. <laughs> but uh, those who have ear to ear, let them hear, kind of an idea. That's not the approach here. Okay, now, so let's get into 1 John. We, we have already seen in 1 John, by the way, why was 1 John written? You might say, oh, no, no, I still believe 1 John is written to see whether you're saved or not. Well, okay, would you believe if God told you something different, would you believe him? I hope you would. 1 John chapter 1, right across the page. Okay, in verse 3 and 4 tells us why 1 John was written. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. Now, why is he writing it? That we may have fellowship. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. Verse 4, and these things write we unto you. There's a second reason. That your joy may be full. Now listen, folks, let's use our, let's use our common sense here. If you, are, if, if you are thinking that God wants you to go through life always worrying on whether you're saved or not, you'll never have full joy. It's impossible. It's impossible. The only way you could have full joy is starting from a point that you're loved and accepted in Christ. And then you can go on from there. See, it's one thing to be saved. It's another thing to be an obedient child. I said, well, I don't know about that. Well, you, you just, okay, let me, let me ask you this. How many of your parents raise your hand? Okay, put them, put them down. How many of you have perfectly obedient children? Raise your hand. George. <laughs> 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 I 
<laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, there is no such thing as a perfectly obedient children, except for one. He lived 2,000 years ago. His name was Jesus. Now, folks, you might say, well, they're not, they're not, they're not perfectly obedient. They're not perfectly obedient. You know what? Nobody's perfectly obedient except Jesus, right? So then, does that mean if a child's not perfectly obedient that they're not a child of that parent? No, that's not what it's saying. That's not what it's saying. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, it says this, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. Who's he writing to? Little children. He doesn't say, my little children, these things write I unto you to see if you're saved or not. But that would be a contradiction in what he just said. No, my little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Okay? Tonight, what are we talking about? We are talking about the path to knowing Christ, not the path to salvation. The path to knowing Christ. It is one thing to be saved. It's another thing to know the Lord in an experiential way on a day-to-day -day basis and Christian walk. So we're going to look at several things here tonight. First is this, the will of God for his children. What is the will of God for his children? Now notice I didn't say the will of God for all humanity. This eventually would be the will of God for all humanity if all humanity was saved. But this is particularly focused on those who are the children of God through faith alone in Christ alone. What is the will of God for his children? We see it in verse 1. My little children, these things write, write I unto you that you sin not. That you sin not. Now, by the way, he wouldn't be writing this to them and telling them that God doesn't want you to sin if it was impossible for them once they were saved to do that, right? Little children, this is a title the Lord uses on those who are believers. He uses it nine times in nine verses here in the book of 1 John. I want you to hold your place here and look at the Gospel of John, chapter 13. The Gospel of John, chapter 13. Now remember, the Gospel of John and 1 John were really not, I don't believe they were written that far apart. I think the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of Revelation were probably all written within five to ten years of each other. Okay, we don't know the exact dates on these things. But in John chapter 13, which is one of the most precious passages in all of the Scripture here, is, is the Lord with his disciples. It was a very intimate time. Okay, it's at the Last Supper. Now I know Judas was there for a period of time, then he left. But here in John chapter 13, look at verse 33, what he says. He says, little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come, so now I say to you. And then he starts talking about the new commandment I give unto you. And by the way, that's going to come up again in 1 John. Now, he's writing this, and you notice what he called his disciples. These people were saved people except for Judas. And you notice what he calls them again. He calls them little children. This is a term that John evidently picked up on. You don't see it in, 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 uh, in a lot of other scriptures. Matter of fact, off the top of my head, I don't know that it's written by anybody else. Maybe it is. I don't know. But this term, as far as addressing those who are believers, this, this term of little children, children, little children. What is it? It's an intimate term. It's a family term. It's a loving term. God is not talking to lost people here. He's talking to his children. Now let's go back to 1 John chapter 2, and it says, my little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Look at the language in verse 1. What do we see? 
let me misread this. And my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, it proves he's not saved. It doesn't say that. It says, if you do, children of God, if you, I don't want you to sin, God says. But if you do, I want you to know you have an advocate with the Father. You have some, someone who, in light of eternity, is taking care of that. And who is it? Jesus Christ, the righteous. See, folks, this is the voice of grace. It should be the goal and desire of every Christian not to sin. Let me say it again. It should be the goal and desire for every Christian not to sin. The Lord did not save us to keep on sinning. Now, you know what? As, as I'm speaking what I'm speaking tonight, you know, I can, I can sense and I can imagine getting this from really from both sides. Those who believe in lordship salvation who say, no, no, you know, don't tell people salvation's a gift, it's free, once you trust Christ, you're eternally secure. Don't tell them that, because that'll lead them into a life of sin. And then there's other people who are saved by grace, who love the fact that they're justified, declared righteous before God, and yet they've gotten this idea into their head that now that they're saved, it doesn't matter how they live their lives. It's okay to sin, it's just not a big deal. Listen, folks, while we cannot lose our salvation, we can lose our fellowship and our walk with God, and God the Father is not happy. He loves, but he's not happy with rebellious children, just like those of you who have children. When your children rebel, you don't say, oh boy, I'm so excited about this. What does it do? It puts a strain on the relationship. Okay? Doesn't change it. It doesn't make that child not your child anymore, but it puts a strain on that. There's a friction. Okay? There's friction in the air. There's a, there's a storm brewing, you might say. And it's exactly the same in the family of God. Okay? I, I love that. Uh, God's will to his children is that you don't sin. But if you do, I want you to know that you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. What about in John chapter 8? Hold your place here and look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8. What about the woman caught in adultery? By the way, that is a fascinating passage of Scripture. What about the woman caught in adultery? Well, it's interesting, by the way, they didn't bring the men, only her. Takes two to tango, right? And so the, the Lord was dealing with the situation, and in John chapter 8, verse 10, it says, When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are th those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. And what's he say then? Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Okay? This is the will of God, that we go and sin no more. It isn't once we're saved then, oh, just go ahead and sin any way you want, and it's okay because it's all under the blood. Folks, that's not the point. That is abusing the grace of God. That is insulting the grace of God. God's plan is that we do live for the Lord once we're saved. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter 4, and we're going to begin in verse 1. This is a consistent truth throughout Scripture. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And once we're saved, we're saved forever. We can't lose our salvation. We'll get more about the idea of advocate in just a minute. But here's the point. We see very clearly it is God's will that once we're saved, we don't sin. Now, 
People say, yeah, but I'm going to sin. Well, that's true. And that's not the will of God, though, but it's true. Do we see that? I don't know why people can't get this or don't want to get it. 1 Peter 4, verse 1, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. And what is he talking about here? The context of 1 Peter is suffering. Suffering Christians, suffering Christians are people who are living godly in Christ Jesus. God says those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And those who are living godly who are being persecuted from, uh, because of their faith, okay, they're living a godly life, they're not living a sinful life. They're living a godly life, they're not living a carnal life. That's not their lifestyle is what I'm saying, okay? That's not, that's not the general characteristic of their life. Look at verse 2. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the, in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. Anybody who's saved should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men. In other words, according to your sin nature, but should live according to the will of God. And what's the will of God? That we live godly, pure lives. Nothing could be clearer than that. Now let's go back to 1 John chapter 2. <clears throat> and we see again the statement here in 1 John 2 verse 1. It says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. So it's very clear that God doesn't want us to sin. Now we saw in chapter 1 the way to not sin is to walk in the light. To walk in the light. Where is that? Walking in the light is where Jesus is walking. It's in the truth. It's in, it's in fellowship with him, but it's according to and with, it's in the word of God. We're walking in the law of the Lord. Not just according to it, but in it. In other words, folks, we are immersed in the idea of a, of a scriptural lifestyle. This is the way we should want to live, is biblically. Not just do things, Christian things, but walk with him. And if we're going to walk with the Lord, he lives and he, he, Jesus was the manifestation of the written word of God. Do we understand that? You could watch Jesus and everything he did was a fulfillment of scripture. And so how did he walk? He walked according to the word of God. He was the living word uh, personified. We have the written word. So for us to walk with him, we have to walk in the light. We have to walk according to scripture. And as we do, we walk in fellowship with him. As we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Any Christian, as I've already covered in this series, any Christian who says, well, you know what? I want to walk in fellowship with God, but they depart and they go off into the darkness of sin. Don't say you're walking in fellowship with God if you're walking according to your old nature, which is darkness, because Jesus isn't there. He's walking according to the light. He's in the light. He's in the light. So the way, the way to not sin is to walk in the light, 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, do you see that? We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. But see, if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, and that's none other than our very Savior himself. Now the word advocate, interesting word, how it's translated here. Other places in John's writing, he translated it as a comforter. The comforter would, uh, it paraclete, or uh, 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 paracletos. An intercessor, a consoler, okay, a comforter. One summoned alongside, that whole idea, isn't that a beautiful picture? Somebody summoned alongside, what would that point to? The idea of fellowship. Somebody come alongside us, and there's that communion. And by the way, the word communion is the word fellowship in Scripture. It's the same Greek word. And so, so there you go, walking that way. So the way to not sin is to walk in the light. When we sin, we have departed from walking in the light. But Jesus Christ is our advocate. 
Okay? Now, which leads us to the second point, and it's this. The foundation of the will of God for his children. And what do we, where do we see that? We see that in verse 2. It says, and he is the propitiation. Now, remember, it says, an, an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So what do we see? What we've seen so far is the will of God for his children which is not to sin. When we do, we see because of what Christ has done, that's the foundation of our relationship with him. We see the foundation of the will of God for his children in verse 2. And what is it? He is the propitiation for our sins. That's why we can walk in fellowship with God is because of what Christ has done for us. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Okay? i got two sub-points I want to focus in on here tonight. Very, very important. The first one is this. Because of what Christ has done, we are secure. Now, I know we know that in this church, but it has to be stated in light of the text here in 1 John. Because of what Christ has done, we are secure. Folks, that's why we, ha- we John was including himself as a 60-year-old believer, That's why we know we're saved because of what Christ has done for us. He said, we have an advocate. Listen, if you weren't saved, you you wouldn't have an advocate. You have to be saved to get that benefit. That's one of the blessings of being a child of God. Jesus is the, is the satisfactory payment. He is the propitiation. So it's because of what Christ has done that we are saved. The satisfactory payment, his payment for our sins, keeps us covered continually and forever from the penalty of sin. Let me say it again. His payment for our sin keeps us covered by his blood continually and forever from the penalty of sin. That's why once I'm saved, I shouldn't sin, but when I do, it is literally under the blood of Christ. The payment he made has not only is good for me the moment I trust Christ, well, listen, it was good for me when he made it, but it wasn't good on my behalf until I accepted it. But once I accepted it, it's good on my behalf forever. That's why I am secure. That's why I can't be lost because the payment he made continues to do its work. Hold your place and look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. After all the wonderful truth we see in the book of Romans... We see in Romans chapter 8, in verse 34, well, verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Those who are saved. Who shall lay anything to their charge? It is God that justifieth. Well, let me ask you this. Have you trusted Christ? Yes. Then you're justified according to chapter 3, chapter 4. You've been justified. You've been declared righteous by God. So the only one who can lay anything to anybody as far as a charge go, it's God. And on your count, if you've trusted Christ the Savior, on your behalf, God says you're justified. Nothing is going to be laid to to your account. Because Jesus, you accepted the payment Jesus made for all your sin. Look at verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So who who is it that could condemn me? Jesus. But wait a minute. I trusted him as my Savior. And he's at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. He's my advocate. He's he's there. He's the intercessor, okay? And no matter, uh, listen, I'm not saying this goes on exactly this way, but you'll get the picture, okay? I'm a child of God. 
I'm a child of God. There's God the Father, God the, God the Son. And then there's that rascal called Satan. And so here I am. I, I, I'm living life as a Christian, and I, and I sin either in thought or deed. And the devil, the accuser of the brethren, the devil says, Ah, hey, God, see what your little squirrely kid did there? Look, look at what they did. Jesus stands up. No, it's under my blood. It's paid in full. And folks, every time we sin, the work of Christ, the blood of Christ, has covered that. And the very one who could condemn me stands up and says, there's no condemnation. They're in me. They are in Christ. I paid the price. Nothing can separate them from my love. This is the wonder, the wonder of our salvation. Now, I don't know about you folks, but hopefully, if you're a believer, hopefully you think about this and you say, man alive, that's the kind of God I want to walk with. Yes, 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 that's the point. God's written these things to us so that we could have joy, that we can have fullness of joy, that we can have fellowship with the Father. Not, I wonder if I'm still saved. Boy, that was a whopper I did today. Well, let me ask you this, dear friend. Should you have done what you did? Well, 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 no, but I did it. But, you know, I'm just really struggling with this. Let me ask you this. When Jesus died on the cross for you, did he pay the price for that sin? Yes. Have you trusted him as Savior? Yes. And you don't have to worry about that. It's, it's been taken care of. It's taken care of. That's why, folks, once you're saved, you're saved forever because the work is an eternal work that goes on and on and on. Not dependent on our faithfulness. It's dependent on the satisfactory payment he made. And notice it wasn't just the payment he made. It's the satisfactory payment he made. The Father was satisfied. That's why it's called a propitiation. That's why he, by the way, that's why Jesus could come back from the dead. Because God was satisfied with the payment he made. And by the way, Jesus knew it when he did it because it's finished, he said, paid in full. Look with me to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. So far from making us test or worry about whether we're saved or not, 1 John is actually a confirmation of our security in Christ and the joy we can have in walking with that precious Savior that we have. Hebrews chapter 7, in verse 24, it says, But this man, because he continueth forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood, wherefore he is able, talking about the Lord now, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Jesus, listen, we are as secure as Jesus is the eternal God. You can't get any more secure than that. Okay? Now, yeah, if he died off and that was the end of him, well, then we may have to fend for ourselves, but it's not going to happen. He's the eternal God. He's always been there. He is God himself. So we are as secure as Jesus Christ is eternal. And, of course, his work is eternal. Now, let's go back to 1 John. I hope you don't mind jumping around like this, folks. We need to see how these scriptures beautifully fit together. The Word of God is a miracle book. Okay? So, what do we see in these sub-points? Sub First, because of what Christ has done, we are secure. He is the propitiation for our sins. And then it says, but not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Do you see that in 1 John 2, verse 2? Listen, if I didn't have another verse in the Bible, that would be enough to put the final nail in the coffin of Calvinism. Calvinism teaches limited atonement. 
In other words, that the payment Jesus made is only good for the elect. In other words, the payment Jesus made is not good for those people who will never be saved. It wasn't made for them. It was only made for the, those who would be saved. That's what Calvinism teaches. How do you get around verse 2? He is the propitiation for our sins. Who's the ours? Our here. Believers. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Okay? So he is the, uh, subpoint B, he is the propitiation for all mankind. His payment is for all. Listen, I want to be very clear tonight. Simply put, Calvinism is a false doctrine. Calvinism is heretical teaching, all right? I'm not saying there aren't some nice people who are Calvinists, nice as far as personality goes. There are some. What, that's not the point, though. The point is the doctrine itself is absolutely, absolutely heretical. Why? Because it contradicts the clear teaching of Scripture. Let me go further. Calvinism is a hideous doctrine. Let me give you an example. Let's say for an example, there's a hundred people. There's a group of a hundred people. And, and Jesus shows up. Now, if, if you were to ask people, you know, okay, what percentage of mankind do you think will go to heaven? Okay, I'm going to be generous tonight. Now, I don't believe it's 10%. I don't believe it's 10. I think it's less than that. But I'm going to be generous tonight, and let's just say for the sake of numbers, 10%. All right? So here's a group of, of 10 people. That means, according to Calvinism, 10 of the, or there's a group of 100 people. According to Calvinism, out of those 100 people, only 10 of those people have been chosen to be saved. Now, Calvinism says this. Well, you know what? Praise God for those 10. God didn't have to save any of them. Isn't God generous that he would choose 10 out of 100? Let me ask you though, friend, if eternity means heaven or hell for every person, then what did he decide for the other 90? Hell. When did he decide it? Before eternity began, or before time began. In eternity past, God knew and planned and chose out of those hundred people, only 10 would go to heaven, and he chose for the other 90 hell for all eternity. In other words, he knew and his plan for them and his, and his, his will for them, he knew they were going to be conceived. He didn't stop the conception because he knew once they were conceived... And if they grew to the point to where they could understand the gospel, but even that, according to God, it wouldn't matter. According to Calvinism, let me put it that way. He knew before they were ever conceived that, conceived that his will for them, now li listen to this, but I'm, I'm going to be biblical on this. His will for those 90 people out of the 100 was that his will for them before they were ever conceived would be that they would be conceived and their destiny would be conscious eternal torment in hell fire, suffering, no rest day nor night forever. That is the dark side of Calvinism. And it makes God a monster. Okay? Okay? That's not the God of the Bible. There's not a person in this room that would do that to 100 people. But here's 100 people. Jesus shows up, and in his hand, he has salvation gifts, the gift of salvation, okay? And he looks at them, and they look and say, Jesus is here, Jesus is here. And he says, yes, I'm here. I've got in my hand a gift of eternal life, the gift of salvation, and I'm going to give it out. And so they, they, they come to him, great, great, and, and they come to him, and he says, now wait a minute, I've already picked out only 10 of you to get this. And he hands it out to those 10 people. 
and the other, what about us? Was, it's not my will that you go to heaven. It's my will that you end up in hell. That's not the God of the Bible. Okay? He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, let me ask you this, friend. If Jesus is the satisfactory payment for the sins of the whole world, then how in the world would he not make salvation open to those people? Why would he be the satisfactory payment for their sin if the payment can't be accepted on their behalf? It is ugly, it is false, and I don't care how popular Calvinism is going to become or is becoming in the world, and it's becoming more and more popular, I don't care how popular it's becoming, it is a hideous, false, evil teaching. Okay? And when you present them with this, here's what the Calvinist says. Well, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. No, friend, the only mystery is how you could believe such nonsense. That's a mystery to me. You might say, well, Pastor, you're kind of fired up about this. Yes, I am, because you know what? You are making my sweet heavenly Father who loves the world a grotesque monster. And I resent it, and it's blasphemy. It's blasphemy. It's not what the Bible says. If you just read the Bible as it's written, okay, it is clear. Look with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. It says in verse 3, look at the language, folks. I love the Word of God, how clear it is. 1 Timothy 2, verse 3, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, verse 4, who will have all men to be saved. All men to be saved. And come into the knowledge of the truth. What's the will of God? Does it not say there the will of God is that all men would be saved? Now, if that's the will of God, then why would he pick only certain ones and keep others away from it? Why would he do that? He wouldn't do that. It wouldn't make any sense. If he says, oh, everybody can be saved, and then he says, no, you can't. That's a contradiction. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, look at it. See, here's where the balance is. It says, for therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men. And then it says, especially of those that believe. Why? He's everyone's Savior, but it's only good on behalf of those who put their faith in Christ. So salvation's open to all, but the only ones who will get it are those who believe, those who trust Christ as Savior. Isn't that just simple? It's just simple. Let's go back to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And now he launches off, uh, off uh, with this foundation, okay? The will of God is that we don't sin, but if we do, we have an advocate with the Father, okay? He is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And then in verse 3, it says, And hereby we do know that we know him, that we know him, if we keep his commandments, Now, people look at that, and here's the way most people read that. And hereby we know that we're saved if we keep his commandments. Did it say that? It said, and hereby we know that we know him, which leads us to our third point. The path to knowing Christ is found in verse 3. It's by keeping his commandments. Who's he writing this to? Little children. He's writing this to save people. He's not writing this to lost people on how to be saved. The word know means to have, to have come to, an un, to understand him. This is practical and experiential. It is not the first time in John's writings, by the way, that it is mentioned. 
You see, the only way we can really get to know the Lord is through obedience, which is walking in the light as He is in the light, which is abiding in Christ. Again, hold your place and look at John chapter 14. Again, written by John. See, this is what John is getting at in 1 John, is what Jesus said in John chapter 14. It's one thing to be saved. It's another thing to be growing in your knowledge of the Lord, your personal walk, getting to know Him more intimately in your life. John 14, 21, Jesus said, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself, make myself known to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, if he loves me, he will keep my words. You notice he didn't say if a man is saved. No, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and, will, and we will come unto, not him, unto him. Notice it doesn't say into him unto him, and make our abode with him. Uh, We will abide. There's fellowship. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. So 1 John is talking about an experiential knowing the Lord, and how is that done? Through keeping his commandments. His keeping his commandments is walking in the light. That's where Jesus walks. If you're going to walk with him, you're going to have to walk in the light. And as you do, you'll get to know him. Now, why? Well, we talked about it last time. It's like going for a walk with somebody. If you want to get to know them, they're saying, they'll say, I'm going for a walk. You might say, can I go for a walk with you? Yeah, come along. And so you tag along and you walk with them. That's, that's joint participation with them. And as you do that and as you converse, you get to know each other better. That's what 1 John is all about. 1 John, again, folks, it's not a test of salvation. It's a test of fellowship. Fellowship, okay? And lastly, we see, getting back to 1 John, the test of knowing Christ. The test of knowing Christ. Are you really growing in your knowledge of him? Are you really getting to know him on a personal level? Okay, okay. This is not mystical, this is practical. And we see in verses 4 through 6 the test of knowing Christ. Verse 4, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Why? Because if you don't keep his word, you can't know him in an experiential way. If he's not obedient, he's not telling the truth, John says. You cannot know Christ through rebellion. The only way we can really get to know the Lord is through obedience. Verse 5, but whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected or accomplished or fulfilled. You get, to, you get to know the love of God. You get to see the love of God at work in your life as we as believers walk in fellowship with him and be obedient to his word. You notice it says, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him, okay? In him. Walking in fellowship with him is the idea. This is defined in verse, or excuse me, in verse 5. It says, whoso keepeth his word in him verily, is the love of God perfected, hereby we know that we are in him. In him in what way? Walking in fellowship with him. I say, oh no, I, I think it means you're, you're saved. Well then, let me ask you this, friend, when you're being disobedient, are you in him or not? Well, I don't know. Well, that's totally contrary to the whole letter. It's written to save people. Nothing could be clearer than that. No, that has to do with walking in fellowship, and that's defined in verse 6. When we see the love of God growing in us, we can rest assured that we are abiding in Christ at that time. Verse 6, he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. This is the key. 
Abiding in Christ brings an experiential knowledge of Christ. You're getting to know the Lord on a more intimate level. If you claim to know the Lord, you ought to walk as He walked. How and where? In the light. This, this would be in and according to the Word of God. And when we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship, one with another. As we, as we do, we get to know the Lord more and more. He becomes more and more real. Just like it said in John 14, as we are obedient to Him, okay, He will come and He will make Himself known to us. He'll manifest Himself to us. He will become more real to me real to us. Our walk with him will be more intimate. That's what John is concerned about in 1 John. And he says, listen, if you say you're walking with the Lord and you're living in rebellion, you're not walking with the Lord. He's not saying you're not saved. He says you're not walking with the Lord. Walking with the Lord's different than being his child. Okay? Listen, I've covered this tonight, but if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, maybe you're not even a child of God yet. Would you put your trust in Jesus Christ as your only hope for heaven? There is no other way except through faith in Christ. When you trust in Him, He's the satisfactory payment for your sin. You need a payment for your sin, okay? We're sinners. You need a payment. Jesus came, He made the payment. Will you trust in Him that He did that for you? If you say, well, no, I'm not going to do that. I'll, I'll trust in my good works. Then you're rejecting the payment he made. Your sin is still on you. The payment hasn't been put to your account. Okay? You haven't been forgiven. You need to trust Christ if you haven't done that. Let's pray, shall we? <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Father, for your word and the challenge to walk by faith, the challenge to walk in fellowship with you, the challenge, Lord, to walk according to your word in the light. We know that's where you are, and if we're going to fellowship with you and get to know you, that's what we need to do. Thank you for this passage, and what an encouragement it is to us, Father, to know that you want us to fellowship with you. You want us to get to know you better. And thank you, Father, for extending that wonderful privilege that we have in grace. Thank you for this time now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.